Thank you very much indeed for the invitation to come and talk to you today. It's a great shame that I can't be with you in Champalamo. It's a fantastic place. So my name is Peter Dayan. I'm at the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics at the University of Tübingen. I'm going to talk about liking as a first draft of the affective future. So let's start with the notion of what liking is itself. This is really a technical term that has been uh, introduced into the literature largely by Kent Berridge and his colleagues. So what it starts off as thinking as a core affective reaction, which is often recognized by its orofacial constraints. So what you see here is liking reactions to a sweet taste where rats, monkeys, and indeed babies have a sort of natural mouth reaction, orofacial reaction that is, to a sweet taste on their tongue. Whereas if you give them a bitter taste, you see another sort of gaping reaction, which is really trying, presumably, to try and expel this from the, from the mouth. And indeed, there's some lovely work by uh, Nadine Gogola and her colleagues, where they've recently used video and deep learning to classify the way that uh, animals, mice in this instance, their facial reactions to a whole variety of different sort of emotional uh, constructs, including these sweet tastes and bitter tastes as well. And in humans, you can often ask people how much they like something on a scale. So here's a, here's a scale that people have from most disliked sensation imaginable to the most liked sensation imaginable um, with something in the middle. And indeed, if you ask subjects you know, how they feel about something, they often will ask you about this distinction between you know, what do you exactly mean by liking? And then we'll see that the contrast of that is something uh, that's called wanting. One thing that's very important that has been really assessed well by uh, Kent and uh, Kent Berridge and his colleagues is that liking seems to be these orofacial reactions are somewhat preserved under dopaminergic blockade, although it may be that the fine structure of the licking behavior is actually different when you have a dopaminergic blockade. And often it's boosted, rather than being boosted by dopaminergic drugs like cocaine, amphetamine and so forth, it seems to be boosted by opioid uh, drugs of various sorts. What's the contrast to liking? What's not liking? So here the, the, the term that uh, Kent is using is wanting, and here we really should think about the motivational import, which is underlying an outcome. So items that are wanted, or indeed even things which are associated with items that are wanted, are attention grabbing. They have what uh, Kent would call incentive salience. They mandate work, which means that animals and people will work in order to deliver them. And here we see something which is very much more under clear dopaminergic control. And indeed, here's a nice picture that I cribbed from uh, Morales and Berridge in a recent uh, review of theirs, where you can see some of the systems which are involved both in liking and wanting. Um, so the, the wanting system shown in green, are these areas associated with dopamine, so the VTA, the, some of the projects of the VTA to the striatum, so here the nucleus cumbens, uh, the uh, core and shell and the dorsal striatum. Um, and you're also seeing areas associated with um, liking, which are these, what uh, Kent calls these hedonic hotspots and cold spots. So here the hotspots are areas which seem, which if you do chemical activation, for instance, you might boost these orofacial liking reactions, um, whereas in the cold spots, maybe you would suppress them. And um, you see there's an interesting collection of uh, hotspots and cold spots. These are relatively small, what, what uh, Kent would call um, uh, fragile um, areas, so this is a fragile system within these larger areas. So for instance, in the shell, you see a hot spot and a cold spot in the vent ventral paladin too which seem to be associated with generating these liking behaviors. So although we see an, a number of areas and these areas are connected together, it's not clear. In fact, it seems that you do not have direct connections between the hot spots and, and either the hot or cold spots in these various areas. As so you can see that these liking systems are presumably activated both by taste signals from the tongue and then also other sorts of sensory cues and so mouth feel it could be, it could be video uh, um, images and so forth, which all uh, go into the thinking about the, the, the liking. And then the wanting system is this very much more robust dopaminergic system we, we have. So to the extent that we can have a distinction between liking and wanting, which indeed there's quite a lot of evidence in this uh, very substantial body of work, the question is why have liking at all? Why would a system evolve that has liking when you know, presumably it's the wanting which really matters? That's the thing which you're mandating work for itself. So one interesting answer comes from the work of Tony Dickinson, Bernard Belain and their colleagues to do with something called incentive learning. And here the idea is that the liking system has the ability to shift the hedonic value of items. So for instance, when you have food aversion learning, um, a food that used to be uh, appetitive, then after a, after you've been sick uh, as a result of it, or maybe as a result of something else associated with it, then you get a hedonic shift, which means now this food is disliked rather than liked. So you would see the negative orofacial reaction instead. 
And what Tony suggested is that this hedonic shift learning is a way of training a model-based system about what the current value of this, of this outcome is. And there are reasons in his mind as to why this, uh, we might need to have this sort of, this sort of training. And um, I think that the, uh, the, the, although this is a clearly very important aspect and we have this intrinsic controllability or intrinsic trainability of this uh, liking system, that clearly is not quite all that's going on. And one of the ways that this has been very nicely examined is in this whole field of flavor nutrient uh, conditioning. So here's a, um, a cartoon I cribbed from uh, um, a paper from Diraho, but the whole uh, area has been worked on very substantially again over 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 decades, and so there's work by, for instance, the likes of uh, Scalfani, who um, introduced a sort of a, a combination of a lick detector and the capacity to gastric infusion, so that it would be possible to separate out the um, the flavour that an animal receives and the content that's actually delivered to the stomach or, in, or into the gut. So here's just one example paradigm that has often been used here. Uh, we'll talk about others as well. And here you see that there are two flavors that the, the, the rat might get, a pink flavor and an orange flavor. And then during some, and they're designed, so they're presumably equally liked at the beginning or equally disliked at the beginning. Then you have a conditioning process by which uh, you pair the delivery of one of these flavors with the infusion of a nutrient, so sucrose or glucose or something nutritive to the animal's gut. And you pair the other flavor with the delivery of a control substance to the gut, so just maybe for instance, just water. Then after a number of days of conditioning, you can come back and do a, a test where you say how much they're willing to, in, to uh, ingest of either, the, either of these two flavors, or maybe how much, if you compare the two of them, a two bottle test, how much they want one, uh, versus, the, one versus the other. And this is just to remind us that there's actually quite a complicated system in the, in the, in the stomach and the, in the gut for processing food. And indeed there are interesting pathways from this to the brain involving areas, involving things like the vagus nerve. So here's one, just one example of an, a paper from uh, Myers and Scalfoni. And what they did was to take two unpleasant flavors. So one was sour, one was bitter, and they paired one with the nutritive uh, contents in the stomach and, and the other one without that. And then here in a one bottle test or a two bottle test, you can see that the one bottle, they, they drink a lot more of the CS plus, the one associated with, with nutritive content. They drink also, if you give them the choice between the two, they much favor the one which is associated with the, the, the nutrient. So this is what we can think of as being something associated with wanting. And the same is true in these 30 minute tests. On the other hand, if you look at the liking responses, so here, these, both these flavors were unpleasant, so sour or bitter, and, and there's no significant difference. So there, there, there looks like a trend, but it's actually not significant between the aversive taste reactivity responses, these orofacial responses to the, uh, to the um, CS plus. So it's not as Dickinson might have argued um, that the liking system revalues how much it likes the flavor, which has been paired with this nutritive content. Now, of course, we don't know that the model, this was, they didn't do a test for model based versus model free um, ingestion of these um, quantities. But nevertheless, uh, this suggests strongly that hedonic shift learning is not the only um, way that we get to control how we uh, control intake. Um, similarly, um, you can take non nutritive sweet taste, something like sucralose, so sweet and low for those of you in America. So these are initially sought by an animal. So they put it on, it has a sweet taste. You see a, or a positive orofacial reaction to it. Um, but in the end, these are ultimately treated according to their nutritive contents, which means that if you actually ingest this uh, sucralose, like a, a sweetened but non-nutritive fluid, in the end, animals uh, know, know that you're fooling them and don't go for it. Um, it's known that you may get initial release of dopamine in the accumbens. So uh, there's some work from uh, uh, Ivan de Rojo's lab. Um, but uh, that, uh, the question is, of course, whether that persists or not. And then if you look at nutritive non-sweet taste, this is the other side where you have something which is not sweet, but you pair it, for instance, with the delivery of something um, uh, uh, appetitive in the gut. Then these are, again, just as we saw in the two bottle test, these are also ultimately treated according to their nutritive contents, not their non-nutritive contents. And it's known that these lead to activity of the dopamine neurons of the VTA, there's work actually from Champalama on that, and also the release of dopamine in the dorsal striatum. And both of these cases are via the vagus nerve, although there's some debate about exactly which part of the vagus nerve and also about the ventral versus dorsal striatal um, aspects of the dopamine associated with this. So there's actually a, well, ongoing work in these areas. Um, so the question this brings up from a reinforcement learning point of view, and this is the reason why we're in this uh, meeting, is what is reward in this instance? So is it the sweet taste or is it the nutritive value? 
And this, of course, is a much more important uh, question, a much more much wider question, which the whole field of reinforcement learning is now um, interested in. So things like intrinsic reward. In the end, the environment provides us doesn't provide us with reward. It provides us with things that we can use, uh, which maybe um, uh, uh, maybe have a beneficial effect on our lifetime or our ability to have uh, children or whatever. Um, and that that is what essentially we have to define reward for ourselves rather than something which is defined by the external environment. And the case of sweetness. We have a sensor in the tongue, which in some sense is just making a prediction about something which may be of value in the future. Um, so the idea that we're going to talk about here, and this is the, the first guess of the affective future, is that something like sweet taste, like sucralose or saccharin, is just a guess. It just says, I think that there's going to be something nutritive that's going to be valuable to you from a nutritive point of view coming in your future. And that we can then potentially use guesses as a way of speeding up learning although not skewing it, so not, not adjusting the final outcome of learning. Um, so we're gonna look at this in the context, um, in a standard reinforcement learning context of model-free Markovian prediction. So here, I'm not gonna think so much about the actions that you do, although of course those are interesting too, and they come along with these, these questions, but instead in the context of just predictions, we want to predict a long run value. So in a Markov prediction task, we have states, so I'll call these S's, we have a terminating state, which we're going to call S star. So we're going to think about a very simple case where there's no temporal discounting. Instead, we just have a terminating state, which will be associated with, with zero value. We have a transition matrix. So the regular, the, the property of, if you start at state S T uh, as, as being S, the property that at S T plus one, you're at state S prime. And again, there's no action here, because it's just a pure prediction task. So it's a Markov prediction. And then we have rewards, which could be deterministic or probabilistic. We're going to make them deterministic for convenience, um, in the, which could be positive or negative. And here we're going to imagine that, as I said, that the, that the reward associated with the terminating state is zero, which means that this um, process will actually um, uh, end up uh, being having finite values. And then if we exclude the terminating state, we can write down the value of any state as being the expected long run sum of the rewards that you expect to get from that state. And here the expectation comes because the, of the transitions, the rewards are deterministic. And then famously, we can write that by the Bellman evaluation equation as being any immediate reward you get at state S plus the sum of other states of the probability you go from state S to state S primed times the value of those states. So here we have a recursive uh, form um, of which of these values must satisfy. If we use this as vectors, then as is extremely well known, we can write down um, the value as being I minus the transition matrix to minus one times the reward. And because we have this terminating state, this and the transition matrix is only of the non-terminal states, this, um, this uh, matrix has a well-defined inverse, which is good. And then um, from a temporal difference learning perspective, given stochastic trajectories, so we start at S1, S2, we end up of course at S star, because that's the terminating state. We can then define the temporal difference error as being the, um, the reward we get plus the value of the next state minus the value of the state we start at. Again, this would be very familiar to, to, to many of you here. Um, and indeed, this is like the difference, a sample difference between the right and left-hand side of this Bellman evaluation equation. That defines a TD error, temporal difference error. And then we have a learning rule where if we have separate representations of the values of each state, which in this literature is sometimes called the conditions of um, serial uh, compound stimulus, then we can then have a learning rule where we change the value of a state proportional, that's the learning rate, to um, the TD prediction error. Okay, so let's think about a flavored nutrient-like case, very simplified, simple, uh, simplified, abstracted case of this. We start at some state here, and then with 30% of the time, we're going to go in a cascade where we first get a drop of, uh, of something on the mouth, which could be sweet or could be nutritive or could be both. And then after some period, so we're going to call it some number of time steps t, the gut finally delivers its verdict on what it was that you uh, drank, whether it was good or not. And then you go to a terminating state. With 70% of the probability, instead you go straight to the terminating state. And here, uh, we're going to imagine you get something which is good, which has a value one in this deterministic way. And then every other value, every other actual value is zero. So even though you taste it here, nothing actually happens. There's no true value to the system until the gut determines that that's actually what, you, what, what was good. And this is the, the wanting value, the thing which actually has to do with nutritive value. So here's one um, sample learning phrase. So here I had a fairly low learning rate, alpha, and we have 10 time steps, so a fair number of time steps. 
And what you can see is a very standard thing that you might imagine for temporal difference learning. Here's the value of the start state. It starts out at zero. It takes a, oh, so this value of the S zero here. And then it uh, takes some time and then it rises to its ultimate value, which would be 0, which would be 0 0.3, right? Because 30% of the time you get this reward of one. And you can see it then wanders around there, around 0 0.3, with a magnitude which has to do with the learning rate, this 0 0.1 learning rate. What this shows is the temporal difference error, both when you go to S1 and when you go straight to S star. And so what you can see is that when you go straight to S1, you have in the end, you have a, a positive temporal difference prediction error, which is a, a 0.7. So you go from something which is worth 0.3 to something which is worth one, because you know that the reward is the true reward is coming. If you get to S star, you have a negative prediction error of a 0.3. And if we average this over a large number of trials, you can see this is then trials, this is then this, this, the values of states. And you can see this very characteristic aspect of how temporal difference learning works when you have these conditioned serial compound stimuli, whereby you get this value propagates backwards over trials, propagates slowly backwards over time within a trial um, to the early earliest piece of information about the reward. So you see, here's the average value here over like 10,000 uh, versions. Here's the average prediction error, which shows something similar. This is more like what we'd expect to record from dopamine cells and these sort of characteristic dopamine cell um, that we see in the work of Adol from Schultz and now Yoshida and, and many others, although of course it's more complicated these days too. And if you look carefully, you can see that there's this randomness at delta, uh, delta of zero, which is shown more clearly in this single run where the, ran where the randomness is happening in, in, these, in these cases because we have this random uh, characteristic. So the most important thing here is that learning is really slow, right? And of course we sort of you know, take that out a little bit by having a slow learning rate. But you can see that learning is, 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 is pretty slow. So, and, and what's happening is even though you have this sweet um, piece of information on your mouth, so your, your, your mouth is capable of determining that there's something good might be coming, might possibly be coming in the future. That information doesn't have any actual effect until the true wanting, the nutritive value, which is the thing which really governs uh, behavior. So this is something which uh, bothered, uh, has bothered reinforcement in literature. And there's a very nice formulation from Andrew Ong um, and Stuart Russell and their colleagues, which they call potential-based shaping. And here the idea is that the system might want to create, if you want to speed up learning, you might want to create a function which reports on state desirability. We'll call this function phi of s. And then you just add this function to the value function for a state. And that means in the context of a temporal difference prediction error, so we're just adding phi to s, it means you get this potential based shaping, this difference in the shaping values of, of these two states, just like we have the difference in the actual values of two states as defined in the TD prediction error. And then the fact that it's a potential function, which means it comes in as this in this differential form, is a, you could think of this as being a sort of no curl condition, means that, and this is why they introduced in the first place is, it doesn't affect the long run reward, which means that the, sort of the normal reward structure, the asymptotic reward structure will be exactly the same. So here we have this from a liking and wanting perspective, we're going to argue that this, this we're going to argue this phi is a bit like a liking function. And that means that we're going to have this nice dissociation between liking and wanting in this case. So, but the point about it is that it already says something about which states are desirable or not, or this is like a guess about which states are desirable. And so we're going to argue that the optimal shaping function for flavor nutrient conditioning is this, is this aspect of liking, this sweet taste that we can see. So here it's going to be one when you know reward is coming in the future, which means that as soon as you get this sweet taste on the mouth, you guess that it's going to be a good idea. And then it's zero when the gut reports, because then you know, by then there's no reward in the future, which means that we can think of phi of s as being one for these intermediate states, s1 up to st minus one, and then phi of s of t is equal to zero. So here's the optimal shaping function, goes from zero, S zero, zero. We don't yet know what's gonna happen. Then as soon as you get it on your tongue here, it goes to one. And then when, it, when the, um, the, the reward actually is reported by the gut, then you get this and it goes back to zero again. And now you see that the learning is instantaneous, right? Um, so here, the average uh, uh, start state value essentially almost instantly goes up to 0.3. The, um, the delta is zero is, is almost correct straight away. The delta of zero in the, neg in the case you go to S star is also correct straight away. And the average delta of T is, uh, you know, there's only a small, um, there's essentially no uh, predict TD prediction errors in this intermediate case. And, this, and then you would see there's a small aspect of very, very fast learning at the beginning because to learn the value of uh, zero. Similarly, interestingly, of course, the average value here is um, zero for all these states. 
And the reason is that the net value is really the sum of the true value function that you have, plus this potential base shaping function, this sweetness that you actually have itself. But in terms of the, uh, you know, the early reliable piece of information that you believe about what the, what the value is going to be, that's this value at state zero. And that then learns very quickly to have the appropriate value as a result of the sweetness. So here we can think of that shaping is consistent with smart initialization for the value function. But of course, in the, and then we don't need any learning if you have smart initialization. But of course, you couldn't have had this, uh, this smart initialization. You couldn't have done that at zero, time zero. You didn't know it was coming. Instead, you have evolution is nicely programmed that when you get this sweet taste, it's a guess that there's going to be something good coming in the future. But that thing that is good that comes in the future, then, um, then when it comes, then of course, this shaping function goes down, down to zero again. It maybe is a little bit unreasonable to think that you can do optimal, have an optimal shaping function, because you know, how could it be that the system knows exactly how long it's going to take the gut to process the food it has? It depends on many other things itself. So here's an example of a, of a suboptimal shaping function, of which there could, of course, be many. And here, this hops up to one straight away when you get the sweet taste on the tongue. And just decays towards zero in some you know, sensible way. You could have many different sorts of things, which means that by the time the gut is processed, it's, it's to zero. And again, you can see that the learning of the, of the initial state value, again, is, is, is dramatically faster. Um, although now you see this average value has a slightly more complicated shape. And the reason for that is it has to learn to compensate for the, um, the, the errors in the shaping function, which is not complete. Similarly, we see an average delta of t, which also shows this complicated uh, relationship. But nevertheless, even this suboptimal shaping function has substantially sped up the course of learning. So it's a really, really good idea. Um, and again, the long run prediction is still the sum of these two things. Um, and what you see is the dopaminergic prediction error, um, as we are arguing, is relatively correct fairly early on. And so then um, also it's obviously correct later on too. We have this sort of incentive uh, salience and get this odd uh, dynamical property as learning proceeds in this way. So just as a little cartoon of flavor nutrient conditioning. So here I've gotten rid of these, these stochasticity and we also sped up the learning rate just to show what happens. So here I'm showing the three standard conditions you might have in this flavor nutrient conditioning where you're separating out the degree of sweetness and the degree of nutrition. So what the green line shows is what happens if you have something which is sweet, so you get your shaping function for it, but it's actually not nutritive. So in the end, the value is zero. So what you see is it starts off, it becomes, it looks like the value is going up. It looks like it's going to gain the center salience. But in the end, the gut wins out. And the gut says, well, this is actually not worth having at all. And so then you get some learning dynamics by which you actually cancel out the effect of this, this shaping function is not so good. The red line shows something which is not sweet, but is nutritive. For instance, you a flavor which you then is associated with the delivery of direct sucrose to the gut. So this starts out as you know, the shaping function isn't working. It doesn't know that it's going to be any good because there's no sweetness to this itself. But in the end, the nutritive value wins out. We know this is associated with dopamine in the, in the um, uh, ventral and potential dorsal striatum. And then this is something which would be wanted and animal would do work for. Then here we have something which is sort of half sweet and, uh, and also nutritious. So we don't have this full degree of shaping, but nevertheless, you learn quickly that this is a good idea and then it's half nutritious and so you get this half value too. So you can see that you get this uh, effect that we expect from flavor nutrient conditioning, whereby something which is sweet but not nutritive then um, uh, starts out as gaining a value and then loses it again, which I think is the critical factor we see in, in the terms of liking and wanting. Okay, so... Uh, um, Kent and I are writing a little uh, piece for current biology. So Kent says, don't say dopamine is the liking neurotransmitter. It looks like dopamine really is not the thing which controls liking, instead it really controls wanting. But do say liking is never simply inherent in a stimulus, but it's actively generated by hedonic systems. So the brain has this hedonic system, which is generating how much liking there should be associated with a um, with something like a food. And this liking actually has a value, and this value of uh, uh, having this liking is that it speeds up learning. It's just a first draft. It's like, you know, they talk about uh, the, the press is, or the media is a first draft of the a newspaper, is a first draft of, the, of history. So here we have a first draft of the future. It says what the value is going to be in this future here. So liking is this myopic first approximate draft of this presbiopic, so this long run wanting, which is going to take the gut a long time to generate. We know that there's some smarts in the liking system. So of course, there's, you know, the, the more complicated, the more sophisticated liking can be, the better. So things like food aversion, and there's a lovely story from Tony Dickinson, which involves Palermo and uh, evil watermelons and red wine, which shows exactly what's going on there. You can ask me about that later. But the, um, the, uh, the, the idea is that the, the liking system isn't sophisticated enough to revalue everything. So hedonic shift learning is not a complete way of doing learning in these contexts. 
And therefore we still have this um, wanting system, um, which is really what's telling us what the true value of any of these aspects is. And so, so the, the fact that hedonic shift learning is incomplete means that we need to have other systems going on too. And then I think we'd like to argue that potential based shaping, so this way we've looked at it from the work of Andrew Ung, has liking and wanting at exactly the correct arm's length. So wanting is really the thing which, which from a reinforcement learning perspective is what we want to organize. And that's the nutritive value itself. But we can then use liking um, in, these, in these other ways. And of course, hedonics are not um, constrained, restricted only to food. They involve many other um, aspects too. And we're very interested now in thinking about the hedonic value, both from a, um, a disliking point of view, so thinking about pain, but also the hedonics of other things like aesthetics, like art and so forth. And thinking about how this works with respect to things like homeostatic um, reinforcement learning. So a very in interesting area um, uh, to explore um, in the future, being explored in many places, including actually, as I mentioned, in Champagne Lake. So thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the chance to talk, and I very much look forward to your questions, which I hope I will be online.